Welcome to Wait Just an InfoSec. My name is John Hubbard and I'm going to be your host for this episode. Got some really, really exciting stuff coming your way today. Uh, as we get going into this episode, I wanted to let you know a little bit about what today's topic is going to be. Uh, with me today, once we get to our uh, kind of core section of our uh, show today, we have the authors of MITRE's 11 Strategies of a World-Class Cybersecurity Operations Center. And today we're going to be focusing on one topic that I think everyone is nearly always interested in discussing, uh, and that is threat hunting. We're going to be taking some polls, we're going to do in some interactive questioning back and forth and talking about the different aspects of threat hunting, where you are, what's holding you back, frameworks and tools and other things like that that can help you get the job done. So definitely stick around for that. Really, really excited for that one. Uh, if you weren't familiar, a little uh, introduction to myself here, I run a podcast called The Blueprint Podcast. And uh, if you weren't familiar with the book that I just had brought up, uh, 11 Strategies of a World Class CSOC is the book that we focused on the entirety of season four, which is just being released in this final episode now. So uh, season four, we were walking through that book, which is all about how to build your security operations team from the ground up, including setting your mission and picking your tools and your data sources, getting threat intelligence, all sorts of good stuff. And we had an entire uh, season dedicated with the authors going through chapter by chapter, giving additional information and context on each of those items. Security operations is one thing I always love talking about. And so I was really excited to get that season out. So definitely check it out if you haven't heard of it before. Uh, we have a QR code link there. And if you just search Blueprint on any of the common podcast aggregators, you're going to find it no problem. So as we get started here, let's see who we have in the chat room. We've got people from all over the world, typically, when we run these things. And it's so cool to see everyone here. Uh, let's see. I see. Good morning from Colorado, from Elliot. I see. Let's see. Who else we got? Uh, Argentina, Nigeria, Central California, Cleveland, Atlanta, Oregon. Hey, we got someone from Philadelphia. That's what's up. Uh, that's where I am here in Philadelphia. Uh, we have Angola. We have Arizona. We have Costa Rica, North Carolina. Oh, no, sorry. North Central Illinois. Uh, we got Benin, we have Brazil, Bahrain, Turkey, Australia, worldwide, right? Grand Rapids, Michigan. I grew up near there in East Lansing, actually, not too far away. India, Greece, Stockholm, Sweden, Egypt, Virginia, Morocco, Canada, India. They're moving so fast now, I can't even read them all. That's so awesome. Uh, so cool to see everyone here um, and really, really excited to get this kicked off. So uh, as we get going here, as I said, if you're just joining right now, we're going to be talking about threat hunting today with the uh, authors of MITRE's 11 Strategies of a World Class Cybersecurity Operations Center. So stick around for that. We're going to have an awesome time, an awesome conversation. We want to hear some engagement from you. We want to take some polls. We want to hear how everyone's doing threat hunting, where you are, what's holding you back, what tools you're using, what is and what is not working for you. And we're going to have a real fun conversation about that as we get started here. So I uh, see all sorts of amazing uh, places scrolling by my screen here. It's so cool to have a global audience for this kind of a thing. So without further ado, uh, let's kick it off here into our first section. Uh, what we're going to be going through here first is some of the uh, most important news of the week. So let's pass it over to Thomas Wolf, which is going to cover News Bites. Uh, hand it over to Thomas. Hello, news fans, and welcome to Wait Just an InfoSec News Bites. I'm contributing editor and your host, Thomas Wolf. Michelle Peterson is out today and will be back with us next week. We have some great stories for you this week, folks. In our first story, Microsoft is investigating zero days in their Windows and Office products. And in the next segment, U.S. government agencies were hacked using a stolen cryptographic key. And in the last story, Fortinet keeps taking the hits with a new flaw found in Forta OS and Forta Proxy. So with that, let's dive right in. Microsoft recently disclosed a yet-to-be-patched zero-day in multiple Windows and Office products. If exploited, attackers could use the remote code execution vulnerabilities to access data, turn off protection, 
and deny system access. For the attack to work, the attacker would have to create a specially crafted Microsoft Office document and convince the victim to open the file. While Microsoft has not yet addressed the flaw, it says it will provide customers with patches as soon as possible. In the meantime, Microsoft has provided some mitigation techniques which you can find the instructions for on the Microsoft website. Threat actors recently exploited this bug to target organizations attending the July NATO summit in Lithuania. In more Microsoft news, the world's largest software maker recently disclosed a China-linked hacker group, Storm-0558, used a stolen cryptographic key to access the Outlook email systems of U.S. government agencies and other organizations. The threat actors accessed and exfiltrated unclassified Exchange Online Outlook data. CISA released an advisory that an unnamed federal agency detected anomalous activity in its M365 cloud environment and reported the issue to Microsoft. Microsoft has since taken steps to prevent the threat actors from accessing email systems from forged authentication tokens. In the advisory, CISA and the FBI strongly urge critical infrastructure organizations to ensure audit logging is enabled. The advisory further details several actions that will not prevent the threat, but will reduce its impact. And another company that's been in the news a lot lately, Fortinet recently disclosed a critical stack-based buffer overflow vulnerability in its Forta OS and Forta Proxy products. Fortinet's advisory warns the flaw could be exploited to allow a remote attacker to execute arbitrary code or command. Fortinet has made updates available to address the issue. If users are unable to update right away, Fortinet recommends disabling HTTP2 support on SSL inspection profiles used by proxy or firewall policies with proxy mode. And those are your SANS news bites for the week. For more critical cybersecurity news and commentary from some of the sharpest minds in InfoSec, don't forget to subscribe to the SANS News Bytes newsletter, your twice weekly summary and analysis of the most significant cybersecurity developments at sans.org backslash newsbytes. Thanks again. I'm your host, Thomas Wolf. I hope to see you again next week. Welcome back, everyone. So what we're going to be getting into today is a topic about security operations and specifically threat hunting in general. And one thing I wanted to note before we jumped into this, uh, if you're at all interested in any SANS training related to security operations content, I actually have two different classes that relate to this. Uh, one is uh, MGT551, which is Building and Leading Security Operations Centers, all about SOC management, building a SOC. And another course, which is SEC 450, Blue Team Fundamentals, Security Operations and Analysis, which I'm really, really excited to say. Uh, if you're looking to take SEC 450, now is the perfect time. I just dropped the biggest update in the history of that entire class. We've added a bunch more labs. We've updated all the labs that were there before, a whole ton of new content, a full revamp of the virtual machine and all the software inside it. So really, really good timing if you're looking for that SOC training and if you're into this conversation we're about to have here. So... Jumping into that, uh, what I'd like to do first is get our first poll question going out there because we're going to have a number of different poll questions. So if you're watching this right now, I want everyone to scan that QR code with your phone and it's going to take you out to the Slido website. With that, you'll be able to interactively uh, answer our poll questions as we go through this conversation and influence what we're going to be talking about once we get the co-host going here in just a second and bring them on. So the first thing I would love to hear from everyone as kind of a jump off question is, does your organization have a defined threat hunting capability? I find that when I teach, a lot of people are a little bit timid, a little bit nervous about, ah, when am I ready to start doing threat hunting? Uh, you know, when is the SOC at a capability level where that's something that we should consider a priority? What kind of skill levels do we need to have? And so I would love to hear if you are a team that is maybe brand new and you haven't even started threat hunting yet, if maybe people are just kind of off doing it on their own and they're doing a little bit of ad hoc threat hunting, just kind of however feels right in the moment. Or if you're starting a team and you've got some processes wrapped around, but maybe you're fairly new in the first year or two and you're still kind of tweaking the process, getting it going. Or maybe you come from a mature organization that's been doing this for years, in which case uh, we would love to hear some of the uh, you know things that you can share with us. Always good to look for the people that have uh, been doing this for years and wrapped around best practice in their process and learned what works and what does not work. And so uh, go ahead and start answering those. And as you all do that, we're going to collect some answers and I want to introduce our guests for the episode. So if we could bring them on, I will let them all do an introduction to themselves as well. Uh, with us today, we have uh, co-hosts Catherine Nerler, Ingrid Parker, and Carson Zimmerman. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Good morning. Good to be here. Fantastic. So Greetings. 
do a quick intro round here. Uh, on my screen, we got Catherine on top. So if we could start with you, then go to Ingrid, then go to Carson. Let's uh, hear a little bit about all of your backgrounds and um, your kind of intersection here with the book and security operations. Yeah, so good morning, glad to be here. Well, it's morning here in the DC area. Um, so I have been in, uh, Catherine Nurler, I've been in cybersecurity operations and actually the cybersecurity field for close to 30 years. Uh, I've done everything from cyber network defense to incident response to cyber threat intelligence to consulting on architectures. So I currently, I tend to focus on uh, research and nonprofit types of organizations. Um, I just like giving back to the community. Fantastic. And Ingrid? Yep. Hey, morning. I am also in the uh, DC area, so it's morning for me as well. Uh, Ingrid Parker, I am one of those that transitioned into cyber after doing some other stuff. So I actually started as an art major way back in school, uh, eventually went into the military, did system administration, and then moved into the, the cyber realm. And currently I am the senior manager of threat hunting at Red Canary. So uh, really interested in the topic today and all the discussions we're gonna have. Uh, but prior to this, I spent 11 years at MITRE, uh, worked everything from kind of low level investigations all the way up to doing uh, architecture for the Department of Defense and kind of more strategic thinking. So really do that full stack security, um, but security operations is definitely my passion. Awesome, and over to Carson. Hey folks, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Carson Zimmerman. Uh, I am also former Meyer working in security operations here for just over 20 years. Uh, super exciting. Um, I'm currently at Microsoft leading an investigations team there. Um, and as far as physical location go, all I have to say is West Coast, Best Coast. Thank you. <laughs> Fighting words from Carson. <laughs> All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me today. So uh, where I wanted to jump off on this is if we could bring the poll answers back up and see where we are. Uh, I wanted to throw this out to the crew. It looks like our biggest answer here is ad hoc threat hunting process followed by no threat hunting. And I had a small suspicion that might have been the thing that came up. So uh, actually, I guess that's tied really with early and, and new team uh, slash some formalized processes. Uh, I know, oh, there now it's winning. <laughs> <laughs> so we're up there kind of in the uh, early on stages for threat hunting for a lot of people. Any thoughts on in your experience and especially as it pertains to the book and some of the guidance in there? Um, what is it that is potentially holding teams back and what should people be thinking about at this stage in their threat hunting uh, kind of cap uh, capability building? So I'll, I'll start because I forgot to mention something very important. First of all, I work for MITRE. Uh, still. And this is a book that we've been talking about for a while, as John mentioned, and it is available for free. And we'll eventually provide a link here to a free version of the book. You can also buy it if you prefer it in print. Um, the cost of print is, is that. So I thought I'd point that out. Threat hunting is in chapter 11 uh, of the book. And um, Carson and Ingrid and I spent a lot of time talking about threat hunting. It's a very exciting topic. So I wanted to point that out. Um, and then, you know, to start, just to start it off, and then I'm sure Ingrid and Carson will jump in, um, you know, threat hunting has become an increasingly more important um, function for your security operations. I'm excited to talk about that um, because it's not good enough to just respond to those things coming in. Um, threat hunting is about looking for stuff proactively. So um, to the question, what's holding people back? Uh, my experience has been the people um, it, it requires skill to start doing threat hunting. And so I'm really encouraging everyone to kind of set a low bar and just try, you know, start looking at log files, if nothing else, just to jump in and get started. But the people tend to be what holds it back. There's just not enough resources to do things. Over. Yeah. And, and building from people, the challenge is if you're in operations, like you're dealing with the fires a lot of times. You're dealing with, uh, with the alerts that come in. You're dealing with what incidents happen. And threat hunting requires that you be able to take a little bit of time to step back and think creatively about the data that you have available, what you can do with it, what you're trying to find. Um, you know, and, and it's very easy to get caught up in a, oh, I'll just start looking for things, you know, in that very ad hoc way and feel like you're not making progress. And so I think it's a combination of needing to decide that you as an organization um, are at a point where this is going to be beneficial to you, that it's going to add to the things that you're trying to do, being clear about a couple outcomes, 
Um, and by outcomes, I don't mean that you've like found the badness um, because there are great outcomes from threat hunting that aren't about just finding incidents, that they really are about understanding your environment or knowing what's not happening in your environment. Um, and then figuring out somehow, some way to dedicate some time to that so that you're not just trying to do hunting in five minute incrementum increments in between the latest you know alert that has popped up on your screen yeah so what i'd love to do here is before we get too far into this let's get to our second poll question where we are actually going to ask people exactly that uh on your team what is it that's preventing you from taking your threat hunting to the next level so everyone if you haven't already joined the uh the slido poll here go ahead and scan that qr code with your phone or you can go to slido.com and type in that number there. And when you get to that page, you can kind of free enter whatever it is that you want. And it, you'll see that some of the, the things other people have typed in as well. And what I'm trying to, to get at here is maybe coalesce around some certain themes and questions that may be getting in the way of your threat hunting team. Uh, I would agree. Oftentimes I see that, you know, it, it's potentially people that is uh, seen as what's in the way. Money, that's an interesting one. Uh, so expertise and money, definitely two things that could potentially show up. Expertise is the other one, right? I talked to a lot of people and they're like, I don't know if I'm ready to do the threat hunting. I don't know where I should get ideas for threat hunting, which is, by the way, going to be our, our next poll. Uh, we're going to ask about where you, where you get your threat hunting ideas and frameworks you use. So those are coming up in just a moment. So don't close those polls once you get those open. Uh, it looks like we got some answers coming in here. So team budget, training, budget, funding, expertise, money. Uh, anyone surprised by any of these things? No, <laughs> uh, I think we I think we've all got feelings about that. And and oh, look at that T expertise and team budget. I, I think it's probably worth starting to address, you know, some of these um, when people think about hunting, um, they often think about this big, grandiose, super formal, super hard to get into high end activity and. I would I would lower the bar a little bit. Um, it is true. I have spoken. In fact, you know, we talked about this before as a team. Um, hunting is not aimlessly wandering through data, nor is it ordinary incident investigation. That said, um, hunting can start from very little um, from very humble beginnings. Um, and you can start, for example, from your incident work and thinking about, oh, how do I pull the string and pull the thread on a thing I saw an incident, but didn't have time for later. So I would say, you know, just trying to like, just not knowing where to start seems to get in people's way. And, and they put that bar too high in both budget and expertise. I'll leave it there. Any other thoughts on uh, any of the words that are popping up here? Yeah. So I'll elaborate on the people part because I meant exactly it, what's coming up here, the expertise uh, and, and the number of people, too. When you say team budget, you know, uh, you know, it's not just um, the skills, it's the tools that go along with it. Um, but as Carson was mention mentioning, you definitely uh, can start with very little, with humble beginnings. You can just start uh, with looking at your previous incidents. You know, I'm not saying incident investigation is the same as threat hunting. But certainly leverage what you've learned from the incidents that you've had um, and start thinking about what might an adversary look like in your data, right? So, um, you know, look for uh, what is an adversary, what's weird, what's an adversary interested in. So expertise is definitely a bar, but if you've done in incident investigation, you can begin by leveraging what you already know. And certainly look at the attack framework. I don't want to be a you know an advertisement for MITRE, but uh, attack.org is a, is a great place to start. It's free information on TTPs that have been curated. So these are actual TTPs of adversaries that are out there um, that you can start by looking at. What does an adversary look like in your environment? So start very humbly, yes. And I think about the, the budget perspective and that expertise perspective and, and gaining buy-in from leadership to spend time on this. And this is where I think it's really important that even if you're early, you think about those outcomes and they don't have to be like Carson and Catherine are saying, they don't have to be these big grandiose, you know, we're going to find everything. It literally can be, hey, we know that we need some new detectors around this because we think it's important to our environment. So let's go in, let's do some hunting, let's find out what's there, let's look at the attack model, let's figure out those, you know, the TTPs that are important to us and, you know, focus hunting in this way 
to find out, is that important to us? Is it something we see in our environment? Should we have better detectors around it? Like that can be a very small loop that you can work on and then be able to show those metrics of how you're improving your, your organization's security posture overall, um, which has a really powerful story to it um, that helps mitigate what I've seen as some of the, the challenges with leadership of them going, well, you're off hunting, you're just playing in data. Um, which, yeah, we're playing in data because it's fun, um, but it really is you're doing it with a purpose. And so I, I would say even if you only have a, you know, a little bit of time each week, figure out what your objective is. Do it consistently. Um, if it's truly, you know, hey, we can only spend two hours a week doing this to start, then do it two hours every week. Have a plan for that and come out with those objectives so that you can start to show the progress and show the value that this is going to bring to your team. Awesome. All great stuff. Uh, I, I do want to get to the next question here as well while we keep going on this. Uh, the second poll, if we could bring that up here, uh, is going to be a little bit about where you get the ideas for what you are going to go threat hunt for. So if you walk into the office and you're like, today, I'm going to go on a threat hunting trip. What is the core input that you are using for that? Is that going to be maybe some something you read on the news that day? Is that going to come from your cyber threat intelligence team? Is that going to be based on previous threat hunts? Is that going to be something, you know, based on whatever your, uh, you know, CISO or your manager, or your director told you to hunt for that day? Do you have plans for hunts uh, where you kind of have like a backlog of things you want to look for, uh, different reports that may be coming up, things like that? I'd love to know um, what your like primary source of ideas for threat hunting is. Open source intelligence, I see, is another one coming up here. Uh, as these answers start to pop up, um, what, uh, to my co-host here, what, what do you think are some of the most valuable resources for going to, especially if you're early on in your, in your threat hunting, uh, where should people be looking for inspiration and priorities for threat hunting? Uh, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I think we're seeing stuff pop up here. Um, we've already talked about incidents. You know, I think one of the major pieces here is other people's data. And that actually goes to one of the funding pieces. Yes, there's a people issue. We've identified that as the high order bit. However, um, a lot of people, when they're doing hunting, they may, be, they may feel like, oh, I have to get all of the data into my own SIM or my own log analytics repository or whatever it is that you're focusing your analysts on. And I would push back a little bit and say, you know, we all agree that the, the SOC should have as much important data as it should. However, some of the best socks and some of the best analysts I've met um, spent most of their time in other people's data. So the point is, is that we, we can use our inspiration and mitigate some aspects of the funding problem by being inspired by other people's data where it exists. Yep. So building on that, um, you can get where can you get other people's data, right? Um, so certainly joining forums of various kinds. Some are in person, some are online. You know, there's uh, various ways that you can um, start talking to other people, especially if they're in an industry that's related to yours, because a lot of times adversaries will target similar kinds of organizations. And some of the powerful um, forums that I've seen over time are where companies have gotten together. Uh, and worked uh, combining and, and uh, sharing the TTPs and the incidents that they've had within um, their organizations. Um, and, and I guess I think it goes without saying too, your own data is a great place to start for cyber threat intelligence. We tend to overlook it sometimes as because like we already have that data, so we want new data, but make sure you use your own, um, your own data that's cyber threat incident data and also what's coming at you, what you're seeing from adversaries. For sure. So let's check a look at some of these other things we have on here. We got risk posture, we got newsletters and threat intelligence, dark web, uh, yeah. CTI, zero days, Twitter, Reddit, OSINT, MITRE. A lot of great options here. It looks like we got some threat intelligence vendors, previous knowledge. That's part of it as well. Um, looking back at what has affected you in the past and just kind of saying like, what have we fallen victim to? What do we know we're still potentially uh, vulnerable to? Where are there potential gaps in our coverage? And you can use that as a hunt trigger to say, like, this is one of our priority attack groups that we're paying attention to. We know they do this thing. We know they're not that good at finding it. And therefore, it would probably make a lot of sense to maybe focus some effort on, on doing that sort of thing. I saw a comment go by, which hopefully I can find here. But 
Uh, something to the effect of, um, there it is, my opinion on threat hunting. Threat hunting should culminate in enhancing the detection in the SIM, custom detections in EDR, and other detective controls. Absolutely, right? If you go threat hunting and you find a thing that works, an analytics, some kind of measure, you know, making sure that feeds back and just becomes the way you do things from there on out and you don't have to threat hunt, <clears throat> excuse me, in that specific way again. Uh, just continuous process improvement through threat hunting as well. Uh, taking what did work, maybe feeding it back to the team and using that and maybe a, a little kind of presentation to the team is tactics I've used in the past to make sure we can start to build up that knowledge on how to do threat hunting across the entire team. Uh, any other kind of thoughts or comments on this from uh, my co-hosts here on, on anything you see on the screen or uh, process for finding inspiration for threat, or, uh, threat hunting? Yeah, so, so one of the things I noticed is there's a lot of ideas here. And I think that's where it can become really challenging when you start to say, oh my goodness, I need to go check Twitter and I've got to read the intelligence feeds. And if you're lucky enough to have an intelligence team, you should be talking to them. Oh, and I've got my own data and I've got other data and I'm part of a, like it just adds up. And so it's, it's one of those where like with everything we do, take a deep breath, step back, find a thing that works for you. Don't feel like you have to do everything. You know, if there's a particular threat intelligence report from a a vendor or SANS or anybody else that is like, yeah, you know what, that's something I look at every week anyway, then start from there. If you've got really good history of your own incident data, start from there. Just find something. Don't feel like you have to do all of this to start with because uh, I've worked with some really large, great hunting teams. They don't look at everything. They're very selective in where they choose to start. Mm -hmm. Sean, there's something you mentioned that I wanted to double down on and also goes off what Ingrid was saying, and that is is emphasizing proactive hunt as a highly collaborative activity, both within the SOC. I mean, this is a way to have analysts, investigators, responders learn from each other, learn about their data estate, learn about analytic technique, learn about the business, et cetera. It is also a collaborative opportunity for the SOC to engage some of its key users, key business owners, key stakeholders who are cyber interested, cyber curious, don't know how to participate. Hunt is the one of the ways we can bring them in and, and make them not just feel loved and not just incorporate their ideas, but really bring their ideas into how we're looking for threats. And then that, as you were stating earlier, kind of dovetails into hopefully some detections later on. Yeah, uh, detections and potentially some building knowledge of the types of groups and the tactics that they're using when they attack you, right? Uh, one of the comments I just saw at the, at the bottom here, how important is attribution? Uh, that's another good question that constantly comes up. I see some smiles from the co-hosts here. Uh, and that's exactly what I want to ask about is how important is it to be able to map what you're seeing and what you're finding in your threat hunts back to a specific threat group? This is actually one of my favorite questions. Um, we deal with this a lot of time. If you're looking at traditional intelligence, uh, they'll tell you that you need perfect attribution. You need to know exactly who's coming at you um, to be able to anticipate. And while that would be wonderful if we had that kind of perfect information, when you work in a security operations, sometimes there's a good enough. So it's if you kind of know basically what's happening and you can kind of attribute it to a particular adversary, it might help you anticipate some of the moves they may make against you and where they may go into your environment, into your intellectual property, what they're going after. Um, so it is useful to have attribution. Um, we talked about uh, something a little bit less. So it's more of an association. So adversary association, so kind of knowing what's happening without the perfect attribution. It's a big, uh, attribution is a big argument in um, security operations, threat hunting, cyber threat intelligence, and traditional intelligence. So, yeah. yeah. Sometimes and I think where we, yeah, where we came down to in the book is, as Catherine was saying, it's association. It's, it's important to know that it is similar to this named group, if somebody's named it, or to this type of activity you've seen before, because it can help you understand what might be coming next or what else you should look for. But it's not the attribution of you can put the named person behind the keyboard, you know, in country of your choice, um, because that doesn't help you as a defender make the decisions you need to make about your own environment. 
Yeah, uh, and attribution can be very costly. Um, and that's the big argument in security operations. It's it's we don't have the resources or the time to go figure out data. exactly who this is, right? And a lot of times we don't have the data. And we don't have the data. Yeah. Yeah. Could you say a little bit, um, I'm sure I have the perfect crowd for this, uh, on group naming conventions. You know, let's say you're threat hunting, you find a domain name, you type in a search and you find that was APT, you know, A or whatever it is. Uh, are we done there or do we need to start kind of collecting additional different names and how might we do that? And just kind of any kind of thoughts you have on um, APT naming conventions and tracking your threat intelligence over time. I love them and I hate them. <laughs> uh, because like, you know, we as humans cannot keep all these different data points in our mind without some way to structure and organize them. Um, naming conventions try and do that. They try and help us create those shortcuts we need to keep a lot of complex information available to us in an easier way. Where they struggle, and this is not the fault of this concept, but where they struggle is um, because we don't, always know exactly when it went into the analysis of how that organization gave that name. We may not be making the same associations within our own environment to make the same kind of analytical decisions about why they grouped it. And this is something we see a lot where somebody will name it one thing, somebody will name it another, and we go, oh, this is the same. But if you have that opportunity to dive in, or maybe you can talk to the analysts at both teams, you realize that they actually had different data they used to come to their assumptions, and it isn't exactly the same. And there are some great um, diagrams out there, especially about some of the Iranian groups that show all the different names. And there's a, a one bubble diagram, you know, I always think of that overlaps all of the, the different pieces. And you can see how it's never a one-to-one -one match. And so I think like everything, they can be helpful to get you a shortcut, but don't jump to the conclusion of, oh, I've seen these three factors, so it's absolutely this. Make sure you understand what went into that naming. Um, and if it's not relevant to you, consider naming it yourself internally until you have a better idea. And if you look at a lot of the um, you know, companies out there that do these intelligence groups, they actually have undefined groups. They actually have groups that are in progress. They are continually reevaluating what they're doing so that it's not just a static of, oh, we named it this, it's always this. Because those groups, um, you know, within countries, within criminal organizations are changing too. So they might not be the same group that they were five years ago. Yeah. All excellent points. And that's exactly what I wanted everyone to, to be sure to hear if they hadn't heard that before is like, this is always in flux, things are changing, there's overlap, there's stuff that seems like it might be the same and not. And so you do have to be careful to try to track, you know, associated group names, but no, it's not a perfect science because every vendor, every kind of threat intelligence group gets their own piece of the pie. Um, the third question I want to jump to here before we run out of time here, we got about 10 more minutes. Uh, it's a little bit about what helps you threat hunt. So what kind of frameworks do you use? What kind of tools do you use? So if we could put that poll question up, hopefully everyone's still on the slide. Oh, this is our final question of the day. Uh, what frameworks or tools help you organize, execute, and measure threat hunts? Uh, if you're out there threat hunting right now, I would love to know, you know, succinct word, tool, whatever it happens to be, what's helping your team actually get this done, figure out the outcomes of, of what you're, uh, uh, getting out of the, the activity of threat hunting and those sorts of things. So uh, if you could jump back into the Slido poll and start typing some of that in, uh, we can take a look at what seems to be helping everyone across the world here as well. Since we got such a, a large audience, we'd be real interested to, uh, to see the answer to this one. One thing I saw go by in the meantime here, I wanted to ask everyone about as well. Uh, there was a comment about zero day threat hunting for zero days being incredibly difficult or impossible to do. Um, and, you know, in very real terms, right, zero day is defined as we don't know what it looks like. So if you're worried about zero days, is there anything in the realm of threat hunting that you can think of that might help people find those kind of activities that we, by definition, have no direct signature for? I think one of the things I, I think about with zero days is there's, you know, the zero day is probably a vulnerability in some particular you know, application piece of hardware, whatever it is. Um, but that's only one phase of the, the life cycle an adversary takes. And so even if that vulnerability is something that you maybe you're not detecting right now, they're going to take next step actions. They're going to create command and control back to their organization, you know, some home base. They're going to do lateral movement. They're going to be doing something else that you probably have some detectors for or that you could be hunting for that's going to be really powerful. And so it's the same thing um, we, we say about 
you know, any, any other kind, like I know during our podcast earlier, we were, you know, with the whole book, we were talking about supply chain, Well, what can you do about supply chain? Because it's so important, um, you know, and you don't see it till it hits you. But the fact is after it hits you, you get to see all of these other indicators. So I would worry less about, oh, can we identify this particular zero day and more about, can you hunt across all the different phases of the life cycle? So you don't get caught short if you miss it in one particular place. Yeah, I, I love that point. And, you know, that's one of those things I'm, I'm constantly trying to stress as well, as, especially with supply chain attacks, because people are like, how am I ever going to catch, you know, the next solar wind style trusted vendor, something embedded in a DLL? It's like, well, you might not catch that phase of it, but that is just the one phase, right? Attackers aren't magic just because they got in doesn't mean they're immediately out the door with everything, right? That's the delivery stage. That's maybe the exploit stage. But um, nearly any attack that's high impact is going to be something that's complex, multi-stage, played out over weeks and months and so while you not may not be able to threat hunt and, and i'm not even sure that this is even true but while you may not be able to threat hunt directly for zero days right there's still every other stage every other tactic every other technique that's used and all of those things have to work for the attack to actually be successful because if you catch any of those things you still stop the attack and that's truly what matters right john i'd like to i'd like to take a somewhat controversial stance um, given the words we see popping up here, and and by the way, flattery will get the audience everywhere. I see <laughs> miter and attack is is the biggest words there. I, I don't even work at miter anymore, but this is great. Um, you know, the the controversial stance I'll take is yeah, sim is important. We all agree with that. There's a bunch of other tools on here that I love. I would argue the most important tool for hunting is where you take your notes. Where are you capturing the queries that you've run, the analytic conclusions you've drawn, the notes you've had from one day to the next? Because I guarantee you, you're going to forget half of it. And considering that hunting is generally a highly collaborative activity, uh, we want to think about capturing those. And oh, by the way, capturing that data and capturing those in the notes, that's not the exact same place as you put your SOPs. Because in 12 months, when you're going to look for something about Bob, you don't want to be bothered with the random query you wrote about Bob. You want to find the SOP about Bob. Just a tip. Ask me how I know. Yeah. So just to build on that, um, threat hunting is an evolution, right? It's a learning process and you're never done. So it's the journey, not the destination. Um, adversaries will change up what they're doing anyway. So uh, yeah, what Carson said is absolutely, I, I don't think so super controversial believe it or not. <laughs> I think keeping <laughs> notes and a history of what you're doing is super, uh, super excellent idea. Um, and I think you were back to the zero days, um, right? Uh, looking for zero days is, is a, I'll just be really bold and say a little bit of a fool's errand because you don't know, there are thousands, millions of vulnerabilities out there and we don't know which vulnerabilities people will build, um, adversaries will build tools for in, in advance, right? But keep on top of it. If you hear about a zero day, certainly be proactive. That's a great place for your threat hunt, hunting team to build a case around. If there's a zero day out there, it does affect your environment, you know, be proactive about it. And one thing I want to bring up uh, that I didn't see on this list was Tahiti, which is a framework for how to think about hunting. And so if you are newer in that process, um, you know, they've got three phases, uh, initiate, hunt, finalize. And I think all the notes Carson was talking about definitely fall in that finalized part. Um, but it's a, you know, it's the, it's the non-technical, it's the process parts that go behind, um, hunting. And it's a great resource, um, that's available out there for everybody to look at. Yeah. If you just Google a uh, Tahiti threat hunting methodology for anyone listening, you will, you'll find the, uh, the PDF on it. There's a whole nice kind of write up of what's going on and all the stages and what to do. And even like a Excel spreadsheet and things that you can track along the way to help uh, make sure, you know, all the, all the value that you've created, all the things that you've discovered, anything that has happened during your threat hunting sessions, get organized, get captured, and then get rolled up into a, a bigger level metric of why you're threat hunting and hopefully justifying the time being spent. Um, that brings me to another question and a comment I saw roll by. Uh, looks like um, Elliot asked, curious how socks tie threat hunting resource costs back to budgeting and value to the organization. Any thoughts how to specifically um, tie the metrics around threat hunting and how you can show that direct value to the organization for the time spent. I know it came up a little bit earlier, but I wanted to directly answer that question because I know a lot of people ask about that. We all take a deep breath because metrics are hard. Uh, but 
Um, this is actually where I think consistency is important. And when you're thinking about metrics, um, consider not just the zero one, you know, yes, no, this number, whatever else. Um, and, and don't focus too much on like how long a hunt takes or exactly how many you do. T try and tie it to the kinds of outputs that you're working on. So, hey, we ran X number of hunts and of that, this percentage resulted in new detectors, this percentage resulted in confirmation that we are not vulnerable to this new zero day, this percentage resulted in um, discovery of the fact that we're running, you know, 16 remote management tools, and perhaps we only need one, uh, if any, uh, you know, whatever it is, so that you're showing kind of this information over time, because if you get caught up in the loop of, oh, we did five hunts this month, the next month we did seven hunts, we did it like that's, that's not going to be successful. And it's not going to set your executives up for asking the right questions about the outputs um, that you're achieving. Yeah. And specifically, you know, when I've briefed um, executives on this, what I've said is we've blocked X number of adversaries that we did not previously know were going to be an adversary for us. Right. So being able to create a block up front, even though you haven't been hit, is one way to, to show the value. I, I think, you know, Ingrid did a great job of reading my mind, as she sometimes does. I, I think there are a couple of things I would add here. Um, one of them is, is we should think about hunts coming in very different sizes, which is why we don't want to over fixate or over index on the number of hunts we run every month. And by the way, that number is usually pretty darn low, even if you're a big team, um, you know, and I would encourage the audience to separate out, you know, hypotheses proven or disproven um, coming out of a hunt from the, hey, we found random bad stuff. You're always going to find random bad stuff in it in a hunt like even if it's totally unsuccessful in finding an adversary and you will be unsuccessful in many of your hunts finding an adversary you will also find serious hygiene issues so one of the things to think about and value return to the business is not just our ability to find adversaries or get better at detecting them but also along the ways you know what did we discover about the enterprise about our user base about our defended services etc and how did we return those discoveries back to the businesses either changes in, in in posture or or you know some other aspect of the overall cybersecurity apparatus yep perfect uh kind of summary and in, in uh kind of direction i think for our audience here and, and unfortunately a, a where we're going to have to wrap up this conversation because i think we're running out of time but what i what i do want to mention here for anyone listening uh, if you haven't already kind of picked up on the link or something from the chat here, we have the uh, 11 Strategies of a World-Class Cybersecurity Operations Center book. It's free. You can download the PDF or you can get the printed version if you'd like to pay a small fee for the printing. Uh, we have the whole Blueprint podcast episode with everyone here that we just released and have been going through every single chapter discussing all the details of it. You can find the Blueprint podcast on any podcast aggregator you listen to podcasts on. We also have it on YouTube for the first time ever. We have video of the conversations and a um, whole bunch of resources out there for these kind of topics. So uh, with that, I'll say thank you to all my co-hosts. Always super fun time talking with you all and uh, really appreciate the time and effort put into this and the podcast and everything else. Great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Thank you, everyone. So. Uh, for our next section here, we are going to transition over to a uh, conversation between uh, Randall Jones and Aaron, uh, Eric Van Bugenout. Sorry, <laughs> got tongue tied there for a second uh, on network security, which is one of our um, big conferences that's going to be coming up. Super, super fun, huge conference in Las Vegas. And I uh, want to transition over to that video and hope to see some of you there. So go ahead and let's cue that up. All right. Hi, I'm Randall, the uh, Benson Vops product marketing manager here at SANS, and I'm here with Eric Van Bugenhout, one of our purple team experts, uh, course author of uh, Security 599 and Security 699. And we're here to talk about a very special event. Uh, I don't know if you've seen, but we are doing a sort of tap takeover, if you will, from uh, offensive ops at Network Security. It is a very fun network security this year. It is our 30th anniversary in Vegas. And so I wanted to bring Eric along because he's going to be out there in Vegas with us teaching and is going to be, um, I don't know, bringing all of his dad jokes and shenanigans and a lot of fun. <laughs> you, did, you didn't tell me I was going to be teaching. I was just like, it's like oh, you want to go to Vegas? I'm like, sure. That's how we lure you all in. So uh, is there anything in particular you're looking forward to at network security? Well, the thing with like network security is one of those big American events, right? And I, I kind of like, I, I'm European, right? So I'm from Belgium. So we, we don't often get invited to the US for that. I'm kidding. 
Uh, now, I think Vegas is, is, is nice. Network security and Vegas in particular is a very nice combination. There's a lot of people, lots of students. Uh, there's lots of instructors as well and a wide variety of different topics being taught. Uh, and I do think that's one of the powers of those big events. You've got all of these curriculums there, all of those um, instructors. That, there's a lot of brain power and a lot of different topics being discussed. And that's what I really like in particular about the big events. Uh, there's just so much variety of uh, things to do. Yeah, the diversity and the variety. So in that case, uh, what are you looking forward to about Vegas? No, this is a more personal question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. So the first time I actually went to Vegas, uh, actually unrelated uh, to Sands, uh, I think it was DEF CON or, or Black Hat that I was there for, was like, Walking into those casinos, like take for example the Mirage, I think they're doing like huge restructuring. When you walk into that 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 casino and you just smell the 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 carpet, the smoke indoors, it's like oh my god, I'm back in my childhood with your grandmother who smokes indoors. <laughs> it's looking very very weird but interesting feeling. So I kind of like the whole old school Vegas charm. It feels incredibly nostalgic, yeah. like home. Thirty years home for us. Well, so that's kind of crazy. <laughs> so. So uh, I mentioned Security 599, Purple Team Tactics uh, and Kill Chain Defenses. You'll be teaching that in Network Security. You also just gave a talk at RSA about the you know, building and always on Purple Team. And so could you just draw a tie for us between Security 599 and the always on Purple Team for us? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think the, the whole Purple Team uh, spiel, if you want, and the whole, um, the whole thing about it is to to build a better collaboration between Red and Build Team, right? This, how do, do they work more effectively together? Uh, so how can they actually use those offensive capabilities, if you will, of the red team to test out certain adversary techniques or tactics, but then immediately look at improving things? Because I, I, I actually, look, I'm in offensive operations, so I'm, I'm all for red teaming, right? Oh, we're good friends. Good stuff. Unfortunately, though, if you're doing pure red teaming all the time, you're always assessing things. We're not necessarily improving, right? right? Because what you do is test, test. It's like you're beating the same thing over and over again. You're trying to get in. Just fine. It's great. With purple teaming, you try to go that next step and actually improve things. You want to test something and then immediately check, did I detect that? Did I prevent that? Yes or no? And how can I improve? And this is really key, is to get purple team moving. It's, it's about continuous improvement. And because you mentioned the RSA talk, what I do there is draw a nice line between, look, we all have limited resources. We have limited people, limited budget. So we all have to make choices. And continuous improvement to me it says it already, if it's continuous, it needs to have a high degree of automation. So what you need to be doing is look at how can we leverage that automation and how it, can we do purple teaming on a continuous basis? How can we emulate these techniques? Uh, partially automatic, of course, granting that you'll never automate a full red team. That's not how it works. But what you can do is uh, automate certain TTPs, the execution of the TTP, and then look at how you can prevent or detect that. And that's really a big thing that we discuss in, in 599. Uh, but also to be fair in the enforcer like six line right? so that's really a, a very big focus on how do you operationalize and how do you get the value out of purple theming uh, which i find um, a lot of people talk about purple theming but how to do it that, that's still a bit of an uh, of a com hey, there's no real big definition on it yet and that's what i'm trying to hoping to achieve with uh, with these courses and with talks like that right right you start you start with red team you try to build in automation you run this automation blue team responds then you all get together and you work on it in an exercise and you try to improve over time. So uh, the RSA talk, I was able to watch it, very engaging. Um, so when you have to do these big talks, how do you present, how do you design your, your presentations so that uh, you can guarantee engagement with your audience, basically? <laughs> They're long days. <laughs> yeah. I would love to give you like a scientific approach, like this is how you build the best presentation ever. Uh, it's a bit of feeling, right? It's like figuring it out, like what, what do people want to, to see and hear? I'm a firm believer in the two things. The first thing is that when people come to your talk or to your course, yeah, they're, they're investing time, right? They're there. So you need to give them something. You need to give them something actionable, something that they can take away and be like, oh yeah, I can use that. I didn't waste my time listening to this random guy talking about stuff here. So that to me is, is big, is making sure that there's a, an immediate value add, something they can use. Uh, that's the first thing. And then the second thing uh, is just who, I'm, who I am. I think we often, Take ourselves a bit too seriously so i like to keep it a bit like lightweight uh, like yeah, let's make a joke here and there i mean life is sufficiently serious right Let, let's not let's make it too serious let's just engage in some light banter as well i think that's 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 a nice combination it, it's worked well for me so that's uh, kind of like how i typically approach these things so i try to put in content so people actually see how oh, it's useful at the same time 
Let's not make it too serious either. In, in that. It is true. The practitioners of the field take themselves very seriously. Um, so <laughs> with that, so you, you come uh, from, well, not from Inviso, but you have a very you know successful company, Inviso or Belgium, and uh, you do a lot of work for the government over there uh, and EMEA and you know, around the world. So uh, what are your, I don't know, your unique, you, you've come into Verbal Team now. What is your sort of unique experience, your background that brought you into this? Well, so probably I used to be a red teamer, like uh, very much focused on uh, at first pen testing and red teaming, so real the offensive stuff. And I did that for many years, to be fair. Uh, I remember 2008 of my first uh, pen testing uh, style stuff. This is, I was straight out of university and I'm like, oh, let's do pen testing. And this is the, this is, gets a bit technical. Maybe you're, maybe you'll remember that, but uh, MS08067. It's like, uh, yeah, everyone's like, what the hell? <laughs> it's like this huge exploit back in 2008. You had like this big issue in SMB. And that was like, oh my God. So that was my, me pen testing the first time. And I'm like, oh, look, this machine. MS08 source, you could literally just knock the system over and boom, pen test. And I was like, this is super easy. I'm the best pen tester ever. <laughs> I was, of course, not too right. <laughs> but what I've learned since then is that, well, red teaming has, has evolved. Pen testing has evolved and it's got much more stealth, much more difficult too. The whole, the whole advent of EDRs and more advanced tooling has made red teaming a more difficult field. Still, I found that biggest challenge is often how do you actually improve stuff and that's how I got lured a bit into the blue teaming side I never really let go of red teaming either because that's a bit where I'm in that purple space but I, I love to be able to talk to the different parties people who are more closer to the offensive stuff we talk about EDR bypasses how that works why that works at the same time actually understanding how to help people improve because that's why we're here I mean 70 percent and don't take that number like an exact like what's your sort no that's exactly yeah just like <laughs> The majority of the work is blue teaming, right? We need to improve things, to be very fair. We need to build better detections, build better preventions. And that's not to take anything away from the offensive side because you need them. They're there and they have a very good uh, reason to exist. But the challenge is often how do you actually improve things? Uh, because that's really where it gets hard. So, I mean, I don't know, extrapolating from that a little bit, is there another sort of real world scenario that you use specifically in 599? I don't know, can you give an example of a real world scenario that you are using to help improve those defenses? Yeah, so, so a few things that I actually focus on in, in 599 is making sure that you give, for example, actionable recommendations. And, and a good example of that is, let's imagine that you're doing this kind of an assessment, pen test, red team, whatever you want. Um, I like this one. The, the age old SMB relay. Now again, very <laughs> technical, but simply put. So you find during one of your assessments as a pentest or red teaming, you implement an SMB relay. This is an attack that's sometimes called um, how to get domain admin before lunch because it's so damn effective. It really works well. And then you get, but how do you prevent it? At, how do you prevent it? I can tell you in one sentence, you have to do something called implementing SMB sign. Nice, that's one sentence. But now comes the kicker. That's very hard. It's, it's super hard. So you get all of these reports telling you, hey, you should implement SMB signing. Well, gee, thanks. I could have Googled that, right? Maybe even <laughs> ChatGPT. He would have told me, hey, you have to implement SMB signing. But guess what? Doing that has a lot of potential dangers with legacy systems. It lowers performance. So it has a huge impact on organization. So what I try to teach in 599 as well is think with the organizations that you're working with and come up with effective recommendations that work for them. Don't come with like the 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 boiler template right, thing right. like, oh, look, this is, uh, that's how to do it. Yeah, of course, everyone knows how you technically or theoretically should do it. It's just not that easy to implement quite often. And that's really the big thing is make it practical and actionable. And that's really what, what I try to, uh, to do. Right, right. That's, uh, so just coming back a bit now that we've, uh, um, spoken about this course in Vegas and, and, uh, uh, network security. Uh, so in the spirit of Vegas, uh, if you wanted to place a bet on the most common password from attendees, <laughs> could you place one? I do like a bit of betting here. And there, so I know you do. <laughs> um, you mean like, so, I have no idea. It's a tricky, right? I would have said in the past, because remember that NIST used to say you have to uh, rotate your password every X amount of times, like every two months or something. And then my best bet would have been like, we're now recording this where, uh, where um, my God, I forgot we're July, right? So. I would have gone for something like 
summer 2023 exclamation mark with a capital S because it meets the default uh, AD password complexity requirements right. and a lot of people use this like scheme where they just change their password with the seasons because it typically matches the 90 days. In a lot of big environments, we're even going to have a good success rate with that. I would be my first. I haven't told it to you. <laughs> Don't share the secret. <laughs> so, also in the spirit of Vegas, if you wanted to give network security a themed cocktail, what would it be? And what do you think would be in it? See, I'm not, I'm not very big on mixing drinks. Uh, so, so I drink them usually. So, uh, I'm, I kind of like margaritas. I always like them. They're like a good solid margarita. It's classic. You can do a lot of harm with it. You would have to def Well, you can do a lot of art with it. Okay. <laughs> Obviously. I just meant you, you can't go wrong with it. It's always nice. Good. Um, I don't know. You mean like, how would I design my own cocktail? Oh, well, how would you put a spin on the margarita for a 30th anniversary of Network Security? I do like spicy margaritas. Spicy margaritas. margaritas. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm not that creative with drinks. No, that's actually very creative. It is the official cocktail of summer 2023, I think. I I don't know. I don't know that at all. Um, <laughs> stick, to, stick to your material. We're good at cybersecurity. It's what we did. Speaking of sticking to our material, yeah. you are a fine connoisseur and collector of dad jokes. I just very cringeworthy dad jokes. Uh, would you maybe share one with us? I don't think they're that cringeworthy. To be fair, uh, I think they're pretty okay. But uh... okay, just one. Now, see, now I'm under pressure, right? And now I have to convince you that it's not cringeworthy. So, okay, here we go. Um, so there's this, um, there's this developer who's being accused of, um, of writing terrible code. So there was this entire thing, like a lawsuit and stuff. And people were telling me, you're writing very bad source code, really terrible. So I, I tried to reach out to him to like, just ask him how he felt about that. But unfortunately, uh, he refuses to comment. And there you have it. <laughs> the cringeworthy dad joke. I so, can only hear the applause. So I, 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 <laughs> so I will say uh, the RSA talk we alluded to is on RSA's website. Uh, it's uh, with uh, Eric here of Mbukadawa and uh, Steven Sims uh, about building the Always On Purple team. You can go look that up right now and watch that. Eric will be teaching at Network Security. It is our 30th anniversary there for SANS in Vegas. We are very excited to be at the event. And uh, thanks for joining me here, man. Thanks. Cheers. See you there. See you there. All right. So you heard it here. Uh, whether you are interested in cyber dad jokes, whether you are interested in the official cocktail of SANS Network Security 2023, which my own recommendation on that would have been Mezcal because you add a little bit of smoke to it and then you get the Vegas experience, right? Uh, I think he's otherwise perfectly on there. Or whether you want to take 599, learn some purple teaming or any of our other 40 plus classes uh, or go to our night events or you know, net wars or anything else we have going on at SANS Network Security. Uh, there's a ton of reasons to be there. So if you're interested in training and jumping in on one of those, go check out the website for SANS Network Security and you can join us in Vegas or you can join us virtually from home. We always have the uh, live online option or on demand as well for those who are busy or cannot travel. So thank you everyone for joining us this week on Wait Just an InfoSec. Hopefully you learned something about threat hunting and you have your next training plan in mind and you got some actionable tips from my co-authors there. So with that, uh, I will leave you to the rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining us here and we will see you back next week where Ryan Chapman is going to be hosting Wait Just an InfoSec. Always a guy you want to tune into. So have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone, and see you next time.